Thank you, Sister Kutlo, Sister Rebecca. It's a perfect song for this day because we're on a journey and he's leading us along. Let's pray. Lord, bless this communion with each other in the word with you. And now, Lord, help us to sense where you're leading us and may we not be afraid. I want to honor you, Lord. We want to honor you. I pray, please use us. Don't pass us by. And now, Lord, help each of us to do what we can with what you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I was walking in the parking lot the other day, and I do a lot of that, sometimes with my coworkers, sometimes by myself, talking with the Lord. And as I came around to the back corner by the public school, there was a lady that was going to intersect paths with me. I might have met her before, but she at least knew who I was. She called out to me as pastor. She was feeling a little discouraged, so we prayed together in the corner of the parking lot out there, and I didn't really expect a whole lot more of it necessarily. I put her phone number in my phone and went on. It wasn't too long later that I got a phone call from her saying she knew a woman that was desiring to put her kids in our church school. Now, this was an unusual circumstance. Uh, This lady that wanted to put her children, wants to put her children in our church school, has an Islamic background, is not from this country. Now, what makes the circumstances so unique is that, number one, I could have been in a completely different place in the parking lot when this woman was out walking with her two young children. Number two... What we didn't know was that the Islamic lady who had prayed a prayer to the Christian God got a phone call to answer that in a very short period of time with the lady I met in the back of the parking lot. Now the lady with the Islamic background who's not from this country originally has two children that are stuck in a public school where drugs are all over the place and the confusion of diversity, equity, and inclusion, in other words, gender dysphoria, is running rampant in the culture of the school. The lady I met in the back of the parking lot said, I think we should go talk to Pastor Kelly. We rendezvoused here in the committee room And the Islamic lady told the story of her prayer being answered, which was only one little piece of a storyline of God putting a chain of circumstances together because I met the lady who knew the Islamic lady but hadn't seen her for years. There's an answered prayer. There's a connection. Now we're sitting here. She's explaining her circumstance. Now, by the time I'm sitting there in the committee room talking with these two mothers, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, God is doing something. Could anybody say amen? Amen. And it's not up for me to say, well, I need six or ten other people to show me this. God is at work. Now, I want to tell you what I did with this mother. I said to her, we would like for your children to be able to go to our school. And I explained to her how it could work. And I said, you know, it's a lot to put two kids in church school. It's over $10,000. And what I think we should probably consider doing is the village church picking up most of that the first year. As a matter of fact, I said, we'll do 80%. But $2,000 for this lady was a big mountain. But you know, friends, everybody can learn to trust Jesus and be shown that he knows how to move mountains. Isn't that right? So I said to her, the first year, considering that she's not a Christian even, and it's not every day that you have a lady that has two little children that are stuck in a drug-infested, ideological-infested place that wants to put them in our school. It's not every day this happens. But I I knew that the church is not a welfare society. I want everybody listening to me. 
If JFK could say, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, certain Jesus Christ deserves a whole lot more. And so I said, this is how I'm going to suggest it works. The first year, we're going to put you in a situation where your kids can be in our school, and we're going to pick up 80% of this. The next year, because I believe there's going to be next years, you're going to do more, and we're going to do less. And the next year after that, you're going to do even more. We're going to eventually... She's going to carry the whole burden. She's not married to somebody that wants to help her. Another layer of challenge. But I said to her, I said, when you get work, you know, I've got a tithe envelope in my hands. I said, when you get work, I said, return 10% to God. Now, I'm teaching her to be a faithful steward before she's even fully surrendered her heart to Jesus Christ. But she's going to find out how faithful Jesus is. And I'm not quite done. So when she left the church that day, she was flying higher than she has flown in years because she had hope that these children she was pouring her life into weren't going to be stolen away by a false ideology and a corrupt culture with drugs. Well, wouldn't you know it? I found out the other day she got a little work. And then just Thursday, I'm sitting here talking with another pastor in this district, sitting on those benches right outside the back door. And I see a man come up that I've never met before. And he says, because we paused our conversation, told me his name, and then this is what he said. He said, I am looking for a certain woman, uh, looking for a woman to clean my house. And then he named off a certain nationality. And it wasn't Hispanic. It was a nationality very close to the nationality of this lady that I had just had this visit with. And I said to him, I think we might be able to help you out. And I called my secretary, Tony Minicus, yesterday. And I said, would you get a hold of this woman that wants to put her kids in school, and would you connect them with this person? Now, I'm here to tell you, friends, in 35 years of ministry, I've never had anybody come to the church and say, I'm looking for somebody to clean my house with a specific ethnicity. I'm just here to tell you, friends, after our secretary called her up, she was flying higher than she was flying before. And what I want to tell you is that God is still the ultimate business partner. He's on the throne, and he's looking for some partnership from us. Now, before this lady ever accepts the Sabbath, the state of the dead, the fact that you don't burn in hell forever, there's no secret about the second coming, and God provides prophetic voice at the end of time, she's going to know that God is alive and real. And we're going to get the chance to help her discover it. And of course, all your offerings to the combined budget out of which we pay a subsidy to the school and scholarship funds to the school and a free and reduced hot lunch for the school and provide tra transportation for the school, all of these things are creating the opportunity. Now, I'm here to tell you, you know that recently in the American news cycles, you've had a discussion about the fact that if Certain countries don't get more money. They don't have more bullets and they don't have more bombs. And I'm against war, but we're living in an evil age and sometimes protecting what's right requires fighting. It's sad. It's too bad. But I want to tell you something. It's awfully nice to know that when light comes up against darkness, there's resources and revenues and committed people to say, you know what? We should and we can help make this happen. And by God's grace, she's going to become a vital steward for the Lord Jesus Christ as well. Now, I want to talk to you this morning about money. I warned you I was going to talk about money. If you didn't hear my warning, well, that's okay too. God brought you anyway. But I'm going to tell you what churches fight about is what husbands and wives fight about. And it's what the receivers of inheritances fight about. But we're not to fight about it. As a matter of fact, we're to be the most generous, large-hearted, broad-minded, committed stewards 
of time, time, my friends, that's money is nothing but liquid time. You've given your time. Somebody gave their time to get that money. Time, treasure, and talent. Now, I'm going to focus on money today for a reason. Because some of you don't know how real God is. And you've not yet watched him step in and do the things only he can do. But I want to tell you, this lady who prayed, Lord, and then got the phone call, and then was reunited, and now is watching God at work. This lady is seeing the evidence that even though God can't be seen, his handiwork is plenty visible. And what I want for my church, and by the way, I'm very proud of this church. This is not a rebuke sermon. This is go on to higher ground sermon. I'm very proud of this church, as Paul would brag on the Macedonians who gave beyond what they had to give, and they did it liberally, and they urged it more I see God at work in this church this way. By the way, we had a concert with Dan Miller the other evening, and we had a wonderful response to that concert. We received $15,000 from the people who attended the concert. Can you say amen? Yeah, but it's better than that. We received another $15,000 from our viewers online. Can you say amen? And then we had one person who even before the concert got a hold of us and said, I've got $5,000 for you. Can you say amen? And I'm sure there's more that's still coming in. So when Pastor Junior made these arrangements and we came to the end of the thing, we're going to feed whole villages for probably whole, whole months and years. And we ought to be rejoicing that God gave us the privilege of being the conduit to do it. Listen, Jesus is coming soon. And Ellen White tells us we should be aggressive in our work. But you can't be aggressive if you go out to battle and you don't have the breastplate of righteousness on and you don't have the shield of faith or the helmet of salvation. Now, why don't everybody get one of these tithe envelopes out? They're right there in front of your, they're right there in front of you as you sit. Let's get one out and look it over so we understand how it works, all right? Tithes and offerings to God. That's right. Pull it out. Let's look at it. Some of you are robbing God and you need this sermon. Some of you are not robbing God, but you need to be encouraged. And some of you didn't even know you were robbing God, but you are. And that's not good. On the first part of this tithe envelope, open it up on the inside, you'll see the tithe. It says underneath it, God appeals to you to put him first in your life. When you faithfully return your tithe, that's 10% of your income, as an act of worship, that's what it should be. You don't pay tithe, friends. God gives you everything you've got. And he says, part of it's not yours. I want it back. And that's the tithe. You don't decide how much tithe is. It's 10%. It's then held in trust at the storehouse of the conference, just as the Sabbath is holy and also is God's tithe holy. Over on the right side, you can see tithe and love offerings. They're not the same. Tithe is not a love offering. Tithe is just a test. You don't return what God said to return. You reside, if you know better, you reside under a curse. Because he entered into this covenant with you where he gave his complete self, his life. And he's wondering what's wrong that you can't give back one-tenth of the ten-tenths he gave you. And he's not a dysfunctional God who's okay with a substandard covenant relationship. No. Just like I tell the staff that I work with, we're, we're bonded. And I'm not going to be in a bad bond We're going to work through our problems. And God says, this is a big enough problem that you need to know something. I'm not rebuking the devourer. I'm not sending you the extra blessings. And you're cursed with a curse. As a matter of fact, your fruit's going to fall off the vine before it should. Because for human beings, they're kind of proud and fun-loving, sometimes pleasure-oriented. They forget that all of this stuff is a miracle environment set up by God. And it's not owed us, not a dime, not a thing. The tithe, it's not a love offering. But when you get underneath that, we get into the love offerings, the local church. That's where most things happen in the Seventh-day Adventist system, the local church. The local church is to become its own vibrant, powerful, beautiful ministry agent. You know, Ellen White says that we're to unseal the wells of benevolence, the the, uh, springs of benevolence. I didn't know it when I started 35 years ago. That was one of my calling, to unseal the springs of of benevolence. Benevolence means generosity. You know, Jacob's wells, they got covered up by some of the people who lived in the land, you know, 4,500 years ago or so. 
It's my job to show you where the rocks are that are stopping the springs of benevolence from flowing in your heart. By God's grace, along with a lot of other leaders, that's happened in this church, praise the Lord. That combined budget is, it works best when we return 5 to 6% of our income to this church. And that covers everything. You want to help a child go to school? Put the money in combined budget. You want to make sure there's evangelistic money? Put it in combined budget. You want to make sure that we can, you know, take care of all the needs of our physical plant? Put them out in a combined budget, but don't make it willy-nilly. We believe in systematic benevolence, which means if I get a million dollars and I give 6%, then I put 6% of that million in there. I don't say, well, that's a lot of money. No, I'm systematically benevolent. I'm going to do that. By the way, if I got a million dollars, I'd give a big thank offering, but I don't have to worry. It hasn't happened. (laughs) Michigan Conference. Let's go to the second bold print. We recommend... 1% to 2% of your income. You know what? There's all kinds of kids that should be in church school in this conference. We have all kinds of immigrants that come to this conference, and if you really want to see them, whether they're in Grand Rapids or whether they're in Mio or wherever they're at, don't miss putting 1%. Put it in there. And you can see the other funds there. If you put your 1% in MAP, it'll be divvied up through the conference for evangelism, for education, for the youth camp. And then there's the world budget. The world budget, we recommend 1% to 2% for the world budget. You want missionaries to continue going? You want to see our Sabbath schools continue to work? You want to see acts of beneficence and, and humanitarian work? Friends, stick one of these in your Bible. Now, I hope everybody's I hope everybody is regularly using Of course, you can give online. But I want to tell you, friends, we make a sacred covenant with the ultimate giver to give back a little bit of what he gives us. Now, some of you listening to me don't know how to say no to yourselves. Some of you don't know how to get by and be a little bit frugal. Some of you go out to eat because you stay up too late at night watching things on your phone you shouldn't watch. You don't have time to get, make a lunch for yourself. Some of you, if you want to give, you're going to have to start finding a way to be frugal and thrifty. A lot of us buy a lot of things secondhand. A lot of us get by with what we've got longer than all the advertisers want us to get by with it. I want to tell you this morning, friends, when you love Jesus, you are glad to get by for his sake. He got by as a poor person for you and me. He was the richest person in the universe and he gave it all up for you and me. So what I want to say to you this morning is God is looking for partnership. Now, let's talk for a minute about the value of a budget. A budget is really good. It gives you a chance to plan out. And I encourage you to think about it. Plan out. I'm returning an honest tithe and I'm going to give a generous offering. And by the way, let's start with baby steps. If you're robbing God with offerings, start with baby steps. Say, Lord, I'll do 1%. I'll do 1% in each of those categories. And as you bless me, I'll grow it. God's okay with that. He doesn't expect you to uh, jump across the Grand Canyon. No, he just expects you to take a step. A budget is important. Now, I want to go over a few scriptures fairly quickly to make sure we understand how this works. But I want to tell you before I start, I am not a, I am not a theoretician this morning. I'm not a theorist. I'm not talking to you about theory. I'm 60 years old. I've pastored for 35 years. I'm going to tell you about fact and practice. I've been young and now I'm old. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. And somebody ought to say amen. Amen. God is faithful. And he's been faithful every step of the way. But God requires us to risk in faith, sacrifice, and watch him go to work. Take your Bibles, if you would, this morning. And open them up, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. I want to show you that money is powerful and can be dangerous. There's a whole chapter in this book, Councils on Stewardship. By the way, get it and read it. You want to live a good life? You want to be free from materialism? You want to be free from debt? 
By the way, get out of debt as fast as you can. The Bible says that the debtor is a slave to the lender. But don't get out of debt at God's expense. You keep returning your tithes and giving a generous offering while you get out of debt. Pay the piper for the sacrifice you need to get out of debt so you can be free. But in this book, Councils on Stewardship, there's a whole chapter entitled Danger in Prosperity. Now, I want to ask yourself, what is one of the most prosperous nations on the face of the planet? This one. Do you know something? She spends pages talking about the danger of money. Now, listen, let's get a little more specific. Many of your kids are going to go to our schools. They're going to graduate, and they're going to make two, three, four times as much money as you did. You know what? That's dangerous. And if you don't teach them how to weaponize it, they're going to be drug into the cesspool of love of money. If you're a young person listening to me today, the Bible says it's good for a person to bear the yoke when they're young. You make twice as much as your parents, give twice as much as your parents. And by the way, the carrying the biggest burdens of this church are often the older folks. When I was a young man, fortunately, I married into a family faithful, generous, and I, I, I got in their game which was generosity. I made $400 a month with my wife, lived in a little building no bigger than some of your tool sheds. That amount today would be equal to $1,165. I did the Google math. Most people know today that if your total monthly income was $1,165, you'd be using most of it for a house. But God gave me a house, the equivalent of today's, at about 300 bucks. And that meant I was able to keep going. I want to tell you, I'm not talking theory. I've been young, now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. Every church I've gone into has had financial challenges, and every church I've left behind, by God's grace, using His principles, unsealing the fountains of benevolence, has been left with plenty of money to do something if they have a will to do it. The problem is there's lots of churches that have no will to do anything except take care of themselves. No wonder God doesn't work any miracles for them because they don't need any. A budget's good, friends. But I'm here to tell you something. The real bottom line of budgets is you need more money coming in than you have going out. And when you have less coming in than you have going out, you got a problem. I don't care how good your budget is. The fact is... You see, God's not going to move the resources of heaven into our bank account until we start making application for some kind of scholarship from heaven that says, Lord, we just grabbed onto something that's bigger than us, and we don't know what to do, but we believe you led us there. And God says, stand aside and see the salvation of the Lord. You know, in Exodus chapter 14, when they were at the Red Sea, they were there by God's direction. Mountains here, sea here, Pharaoh's armies here, nowhere to go, and they're crying out, complaining. But God got them there, and God was the only one that could get them out. We're on a journey. He's leading his children along. This property next door, our plans, we believe, prayed over, talked over. Five, five uh, town hall meetings. One negative vote in the whole thing, and I'm hoping that person was confused. But we've gone through a number of, of dynamics, and here we are on the cusp of a 12 to $14 million project. What are we going to do? Are we going to wring our hands and say, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know? Or are we going to say, God brought us this far, and he's taken us the rest of the way? By the way, this church had to take baby steps in its beginning days. It was a big deal to give an extra thousand dollars to neighbor to neighbor, an extra thousand dollars to education, and an extra thousand dollars to evangelism 10 years ago. But you know what? If you take a little step, God will make you a little more confident, and pretty soon you don't have to walk, you can run. Friends, we're on a journey. God leads his dear children along. And he says, step aside and see the salvation of the Lord. But like that Exodus journey, they got a lot of things wrong. Didn't they get a lot of things wrong? They sure did. But they did get one thing. There is one really bright chapter in the Exodus. Do you remember that part where Moses says, we need some substance to build the sanctuary? If there's a bright chapter in the Exodus, it's the one where they bring so much stuff that Moses says, stop. <laughs> we don't know what to do with it. And I want you to understand, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, but he doesn't sell them and send the resources to the church until the church is sold out for the mission of God. There's no reason to make your life easy when in reality what you need is faith for the hard times that's coming. 
Take your Bibles and open up to the book of 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17. I want to tell you, there is danger in prosperity, but there's also prosperity in faithfulness. 1 Kings chapter 17, the story of a lady who had come to her time of trouble. This is a Phoenician lady. She's a Sidonian. She's not an Israelite. And by the way, in Jesus' ministry, when he stands up to preach and he says in the days of Elisha, God couldn't send him to any of the Israelites. He sent him to the woman of Zarephath. They wanted to stone him. Why? Because this is a chapter that shows that God's people have been unfaithful, but there were faithful people that weren't yet a part of the formal family of God. Here she is. It hasn't rained for a long time. And now Elijah needs different accommodations. Verse 6, the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and the bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Verse 7, it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. You know why? They were cursed. They had gone the wrong way. They had done the wrong things. They had been blessed financially, and they had used it to destroy themselves. Satan is on your track if you've got any kind of opportunity to be a steward for God. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon. You know, this is by Tyre. This lady's a Phoenician. And stay there because I've commanded a widow there to provide for you. What do we know? We know that there are people outside of a knowledge, a fuller knowledge of the truth, that have enough knowledge of God to do what he says. And they're in a relationship with him. And maybe that's you today, friends. I consider the God-ordained appointment with the uh, Islamic woman to be of a similar sort. She never for one moment bucked the idea that she should partner with God and return it on his tithe. So he's sending her to a woman, him to a woman of Zarephath. So he arose and he went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, she was there, that woman. And she was gathering sticks. And he called her and he said, please go get me a little water in a jar that I may drink. Well, water's a scarce commodity right now, but I'll get you some. And her clothes are probably dusty, probably haven't been washed in a long time. And she's walking away. But you need to know something. This is the worst day of her life because she's been faithful to God and she's wondering why it's not working out better. And if you're in that position right now, you just hang on. God knows how long to test your faith and strengthen the sinew and the muscle of your confidence in him before he shows up and says, all right, it's over. I've got it handled. She's walking off from the gate and Elijah, probably hesitant to do what God said, Ask for not just water, Elijah. You ask for food too. And as she's walking off, he says, and I'm kind of hungry. Would you make me something to eat? And her stooped shoulders and her bent over head, she stops in her path. She stands there for a second. She's not sure what to do because for weeks and months, she's known the end is coming. You want to talk about a time of trouble? Be in a position where it's quit raining. There's no food. You have no money and there's almost no water. And she stops. And she straightens her shoulders and she's got a little bit of a chutzpah in her because he's asking for the one thing she doesn't want to give and it's the last meal. And she turns around and she says to him, do you know what you're asking for? I've got enough to feed my boy one more time and then it's curtains. Yes, I know what I'm asking for. Do what I said and God will take care of you. There's a formula for life. Do what God says and let God take care of you. That's a formula for churches, by the way. But when churches don't pray and talk, and I'm all for strategy, but I'm telling you, we got so many smart people, we got so much strategy, we need a little more prayer. How about if we get some prayerful strategy? Could someone say amen? I'm not against your wisdom. I'm not against the wisdom of this group, the expertise you have, but I'm here to tell you something. It's just like a budget. A budget is only good if you got more coming in than you got going out. And at this point in time, This lady has got more going out than she's got coming in. And Elijah says, lady, keep trusting God. And you know what she does? And I'm here to tell you, she ate with one more person at the table for months before it ever rained again. This is God's way. And when you don't think it can be done, it's because the devil's whispering in your ears telling you, don't do that. That doesn't make sense. But friends, we need to learn to hear the voice of God speaking conviction to our hearts. 
and we learn it by obedience. When we know He's saying do it, and if it seems really outlandish, bounce it off somebody else to make sure you're not wacko. But if somebody else says to you, it doesn't sound so strange to me, kind of sounds like God. Might be your spouse. Take the step. Because your face not going to grow. I want to tell you, she was out of food and probably close to being out of water. But because she obeyed, her time of trouble was turned into a time of triumph. And that's what God's going to do for us. But we've got to learn now. You can't wait until the end to get this kind of faith. And someday we're going to learn about her journey. Not so different from this Islamic lady that showed up and is now believing because she's got the wind of faith under her wings that God's alive and he'll take care of it all. This is where we're headed. We need spiritual confidence. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn over to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 20 and 21. Luke chapter 20. If I could preach a theology of stewardship just on the widows and the single women in the Bible, I'd shame us all. I'd shame us all. Luke chapter 20. I don't want to shame you. I want to encourage you. Don't be afraid. Now, in Luke chapter 20, looking at verse 46, we have a very negative description of the scribes and the Pharisees. Now remember, the divisions in the Bible were inserted in about the 1400s. They're not holy. The words in the Bible are conveying the holy truths of the Scripture, but the numbers that, that break the narrative up so you can reference it, they're not. So imagine reading these verses without separation of 20 to 21. He says, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love respectful greetings in the marketplaces and chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at, at banquets. But it gets bad, verse 47, who devour widows' houses for appearances' sake, offer long prayers. These receive greater condemnation. And he looked up. Seems to me like the narrative ought to be connected. And he looked up and he saw the rich putting in their gifts into the treasury. And he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And he said, truly I say unto you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. So they, out of all their surplus, put into the offering. But she, out of her poverty, put in that she had to live on. Now, this morning, I thank my wife for bringing this in. I'm holding in my hands, and thank you to the online member who sent this to me. I'm holding in my hands a little mite. And when I was talking with uh, one of our coin dealers uh, just the other day, he basically told me, this little copper mite is a fraction of a fraction of anything worth spending. But she had two of them. I mean, this coin in my hand is probably a couple thousand years old. And I could, I could barely see it making any noise as it tinkled onto the top of the pile of rich gifts. But Jesus just got done saying, they devour widows' houses for, and for a pretense pray long prayers. And then he looks up and he sees a widow, another widow. And this is all she's got. She's got two of these. And by the way, it's littler than a dime. I've got it in a nice plastic case. Again, thank you, member who sent it to us online. And they fall in. The book Desires Ages tells us that her eyes met Jesus' eyes and she heard his words. And she was so grateful he understood it was the last of the last, just like the woman in 1 Kings 17. It was the end of the end. And of course, we could talk about Mary who took that year's worth of wages, which I'm sure was her security because she had left behind the means of living that had gotten it for her. I want you to think about that. You don't save up a, a, a year's worth of money on an ordinary salary as a middle-aged woman. This money was a leftover from all those years of doing things the wrong way with her physical person. And she takes that and she breaks it on Jesus' feet. That's her future. And Judas is there to say, what a waste. And the others start saying, what a waste. And Jesus says, you don't know what you're talking about. It was no waste. Friends, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Ellen White tells us if you want to get over covetousness, which by the way is commandment number what? What? Come on now. Read your Bibles. Commandment number 10, which means it's the last, which means God bookends starting with the most important and probably sticks the most dangerous on the very end. 
Spirit of Prophecy tells us if you want to kill covetousness, you got to starve it to get to death with regular systematic giving. Listen, we live in a materialistic age, and has it made us happy, yes or no? Well, some of you are happier than I thought. <laughs> You're not materialistic people, and I'm glad for you. But it hasn't made people happy. We're going to get old and die. I don't care how rich you are. Then you're going to wonder, did my life matter? Did I do anything with it? I see these young people paying close attention to what I'm saying. The Bible says it's good to bear the yoke when you're young. Young people, it's your life that's the biggest offering. Sister Kutlow, she slipped away. This is her second to the last Sabbath with us. She spent... Almost two years of her life donating her time here. Oh, we've given her a small stipend so she could live. But she spent almost two years of her life here serving God's church. And when you look online and you see videos, or if you're at the eighth grade graduation, you see all those nice videos, that's Sister Kutlow's work. She's going on to a real job now that's still a ministry. She could probably go command big wages somewhere, but she's giving her life to serving Christ. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. This is how God calls us. Your time, your talent, and of course your money. But money is the easiest part to give. It's just a little bit of liquid time. There's danger in prosperity. Don't let it suck you in. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because those who come to Him must believe that He exists and He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Friends, this is probably the easiest sermon. My wife tells me there's two things I like to preach on. One is money, and one is Christian education. And she's right, because I was won to Christ through Christian education, and my dad refinanced his house so I could stay in. My dad was a generous man, but he can't compare with the generosity of my heavenly Father. And I have never, in 35 years of working to take care of my own family, which I haven't had to do a lot because God's always a step ahead of me, giving me what I really want. That's what the Bible says. Delight yourself in God, and he'll give you the what? The desires of your heart. I'm no longer what I was. I'm praying to be like Caleb and Joshua because I'm not decrepit at this moment in time. But after six decades of living, I know something. I've never come up against anything God wants done for me personally or for the churches I'm with. And if I'm in God's will, I have yet to see God trip and fall and not show up. Oh, sometimes he draws out of me more than I thought I wanted to give. But I want to remind you something. Every loaf of bread, every breath you take, every opportunity you it's all stamped with the cross of Calvary. When we sinned in the garden, they should have died on the spot. Jesus stepped in and said, no, no. They can choose. They can be born again. They can have hope. They're not servile slaves of the devil. I'm protecting them. Cost him everything. All of heaven was poured out so I could have hope, so I could have love. And God's given those things to me, and he's still giving them to him. 12 to $14 million next to our friends. I don't know how we're going to do it. I don't know how far we'll get. But I do know this. You put one step in front of the other. You take a step. And I do know this. If you wanted a little bit of encouragement, nothing could have been more encouraging than our start. We raised over a million dollars in about two or three months. We didn't raise it. God provided it. What are we going to do now? Don't worry. God's work done God's way will never lack for God's supply. I've been young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging bread. They're ever merciful and they lend freely. Give to the poor. God will pay you back. Starve that covetousness to death. Start returning a faithful tithe and start giving a generous offering systematically. And all it's going to do for you is build your faith because the offer still stands. Test me and prove me and see if I won't reward your confidence in me. Lord, there's so many people here who could testify of your faithfulness because I know, Lord, most people listening to this message have discovered a long time ago that putting you first and finding you faithful has brought them great security and great joy. For those, Lord, that are yet to discover it, this message was an invitation. 
For those of us that have discovered it already, it's a call to more. Because we're living in Earth's last hour and our work is to be aggressive, we are to do more than any other generation has ever done. We're looking to you now, Lord. We don't want to be afraid. Teach us how to get by, how to use it up, wear it out, make it do, do without, so that your cause can have what it needs and it's not running on a shoestring. Now, Lord, bless especially those young men and young women listening to this message who could give a year or two of their lives. And I'm praying, Lord, may they sense the upward call of Christ, that there's no greater noble purpose than being distinctly purposeful with their time for you. Now, Lord, you know what's before us. You can see the future. You're going to stretch us and grow us. And I pray, Lord, may our faith not falter because you've been so faithful up to this point in time. Help us to keep reliving the story, telling the story. And I pray, bless that food that will be bought by the money that was brought in for Zambia. And I pray, Lord, may we all have the internal sense of good having done with what you gave us for the sake of someone who has little to nothing. Our lives are your Lord. Unseal the springs of benevolence. And may we be happy in Jesus, who was a giver and is a giver. In his name we pray now. Amen. Join us in singing. Join us in singing. My eyes have seen the glory.